Hey everyone, it's Steph here with the final video in our deep dive into going through the complete baking, texturing and rendering pipeline for this cargo ship model. In the previous video, I finished off the grime and texture work ready for export. So in this video, I'll show off how to use toolbags material layering to create some fun fire effects, how to make camera animations and also demonstrate how to easily light our model. All of this will be capped off with a render at the end, showing off all our hard work. So let's hop to it. First up, I need to set up the render scene. Sure, you can render the texture project if you have no problems with performance and you were happy working away in one-to-one -one preview mode. But if you're like me and make these insane texture projects with many 4K UDIMs, you'll want to get the best bang for buck in terms of quality for performance. To do that, you'll want to export the textures out from the texture project and assign them to the material. So the best way to do that is to take note of every texture being linked over to the material and then set up exports for each one. If you can jam all the linear grayscale textures into a mix map, that'll not only save disk space, but also some VRAM too. So I have here a mix map and then the normal, albedo and emissive set up to export as RGB. Once I export these, I can then assign them to a material by dragging in the albedo from the folder onto a duplicated copy of the spaceship material that I've named New Spaceship. When I drag this on, most slots will be auto-filled except for the mix map. I'll manually set that up real quick. I'll make a copy of the mesh and then apply the new material onto it while making sure that the glass material gets reapplied. I make a copy of the mesh so that I don't disturb the texture project's UDIM assignments and it makes it easier to compare the new material with the original texture project. Once I have confirmed it looks exactly the same, I can go in and delete the texture project, the old material and the extra mesh. I'll now save this as a new scene called Render Scene. My VRAM is so much happier now and I can move on to the fire. I'll start by importing a mesh for the fire. This is basically a rounded cube stretched. The caps have been removed, so it's a square tube and then it's been rounded to fit the engine exhaust. It's also been remeshed to have the topology in a way when I displace it and subdivide it, it will displace evenly. And the UVs are just planar mapped from Y to fit into a UV 0 to 1 window. So I'll go over to the mesh settings and in here I'll have an option to toggle off cull back faces. I'll also add a couple of subdivisions on the mesh. Awesome, that's the mesh setup. I can now go over and set up the layered material by using the mask layering mode. In the base layer, I'll turn on height displacement, albedo, unlit diffusion, heat emission, and transparency. I'm going to set the albedo to black, the heat to 50 intensity and temps to around 1200 Kelvin. I'll add the first material layer and name this flames. In this layer, I'll use this crinkles texture from the library. I'll drop that into the displacement and emission. Once again, I'll set the intensity to 50, but raise the temp slightly to 1500 Kelvin. The transparency will use the grunge stains texture, which I'll drag on and then I'll set the blend mode to multiply. This is different from standard blending, as standard blending will only make this layer transparent to the one under it which is a great way to detail blend between material layers. To actually affect the base layer's transparency though, you need to use a blend mode. In this case, I'm using multiply. So we get this funny looking hot sausage. I need to adjust some of the texture UVs to make this work a little better. So I'll stretch the texture to look more flame-like. First, I have to reduce the tiling on U to 0.07 and then bump the tiling on V to be 1.1. I like using weird numbers with this stuff, and it's slightly offsetting the tiling as well. Right, so let's make this look more like flames by adding a new material layer named Blend. This will have everything disabled except emission and transparency. In this, I have a linear gradient imported in both texture inputs. The intensity is going to be really hot here, so I'll set that to 50 and the temps to 1800 Kelvin. For the transparency, I'm going to set this to linear burn, and it will look much more like flames. So now for the fun part, and that is animating the flames. It's super simple, all we want to do is animate the texture offset on the flames layer. 
So I'll head over to the Animate tab and expand the keyframes window. With my fire material selected, it will show up on the keyframes list. I'll navigate inside all the options down into the Flames Layers UV section. In this, I'm going to control select both the Offset U and Offset V nodes. With the flame on zero and both nodes selected, I will click the Add Keyframe button here. Then I'll scrub to the end of the timeline and hit the keyframe button again. Now to edit the keyframe is really simple. I can just change the offset values in the material. So I'll change both to negative two. You'll see inside the keyframe window, it'll update the curves. Yeah, now I can select all the keyframes and set them to linear and press play. It's working, but it's not the best. So I'll go over and scrub to the ends and edit the offset U value to negative five. I can also move the keyframe curve up and down inside the window, but I prefer typing. Pressing play again, we can see it's much better and faster. Easy as. If you wanna learn a more in-depth tutorial on how to make cool flames plus their heat distortion, Joe Wilson made an awesome write-up on doing just that over on the resources section of the Marmoset website. Check out the link in the description to have a gander at that beauty. While we have flames, we don't have much more lighting at the moment for that. So I'll quickly go over a few ways to add lights to your scene. Usually the way I do it is I set up a skylight first. Today I'm going to use this railway underpass, which reminds me of a hangar. Next, I'll click on the image in the sky settings and add three lights to the scene. Now I can rotate the sky using shift right click and dragging it to get it into a position I like. It's pretty simple, but it's not super dynamic. What I might do instead is delete these lights and turn down the sky brightness so I can focus on just the lights. Next, I'll add in a three point lighting setup from the tool bag library into the scene and nest the rim and fill lights into the key light. This is so when I start adjusting the key light, the others will be complementing it. Right now, I'm going to head up to the top bar and select this little tool here called a light controller. Basically, this gizmo will allow me to click and drag the light highlight on the model and that will point the light where we want it. I'll click and place the light looking at this point on the model here. And as I click and drag on the model now, you should be able to see the rim light moving as well. The neat thing I like doing is changing the shape of the light, which I can do in the light settings. I'll change the shape from a sphere to rectangular to mimic an indoor light. I'll adjust the width and height, and you can see how that affects the shape of the spot and the softness of the shadows. Now, as I use the light controller tool to move it, that should show it as clear as day. Right. Now I've set my key light, I can go down and click the rim light and the light tool is still selected. So I can just click to reposition the light like so. Same with the fill light. Now that I have them set, I can unparent the light so that if I need to move the key light, it won't affect them anymore. I just need to adjust the rim light a little bit more. So I'll use the hotkey control left mouse button to adjust the intensity. There are some other cool hotkeys you can use too, like control plus middle mouse button to adjust the spot cone angle and control right mouse button to move the light in or away from the surface. Now I can go back and adjust the backdrop brightness to an acceptable level. Nice, that should do for now. While I'm here, I will add a shadow capture object by right clicking and choosing add shadow capture object. Shadow catchers come with a special assigned material to them that you can tweak in the shadow catcher settings. What I want to do now is crank the roughness and the spec. So I'll toggle on the indirect shadow setting on the shadow catcher. And now I have access to adjust these properties. I'll switch to ray trace rendering so that I can see how it looks. Nice, it's so shiny. Now that the lights are set up, I can move to making a cool animated camera. One of the neat things I want to show off is how to make a camera follow a target. So I'll make a dummy for the camera to point at, which is just going to be an empty group. I'll select an empty part of the hierarchy and hit the create group button. I'll rename this so I don't get confused. Camera target sounds like a good name. While I'm here, I should make a new camera. 
I'll call this one follow camera one. So I know that this is the one that uses the target. Inside the camera settings, I'll enable follow target. I'll pop back up to the camera target and in the group settings, I will enable camera target. Now, if I move my camera target around, you'll see that the camera will follow it. There is a follow lag setting here, so I might drop that down to five for now. A quick note is that there can only be one camera target enabled at any one time. So if you enable the camera target setting on another object, it will turn off any enabled camera targets you have and set it to the new object. So time to start animating something simple. I want to start with the pan at the back to introduce the ship and then move the camera and the target to the front and then do a final pan at that front part. It sounds complex, but it's pretty simple. I'll start with setting up the animation length to 20 seconds by changing the length number on the bottom of the timeline window. I'll hit no on this pop-up. Then I'll set the frame zero keyframes. I'll do this by selecting the target in the scene hierarchy, moving the keyframes window to find the transform nodes. Rolling that out, I'll select the translation axes and hit the keyframe button. Righto, we have zero on the target. Time to find a place where I can finish the pan and move the camera and target to frame. I'm gonna pick the frame five seconds in and add a keyframe here for both the camera and the target. Scrubbing back to zero, I'll move the camera target and that should update the keyframe data so I can press play to see how this looks. Nice. But the follow lag on the camera is pretty distracting, so I'll turn that to zero. Now I'll animate the camera truck by setting new keyframes for both the camera target and the camera at 14 seconds. Then a final keyframe at 20 for both target and camera. I'll adjust the camera and target for each keyframe. Testing this out now looks pretty good. As you can see, there are so many cool ways to animate not just the camera, to get some really cool shots for your renders in Toolbag 5. Now that I have all my lighting and my camera, it's time to finally set up the render. Let me go in and adjust some of these camera post effects by selecting Follow Camera 1. I'll add a slight vignette and some bloom and confirm that the tone mapper is set to AGX, which is the new default tone mapper added in Toolbag 5. I'll move to the render tab and set the renderer to ray tracing. In the render cams, I'll choose to use follow cam one. Then I'll give main camera a boot by pressing the X next to its name. Down in video output, I'll set the samples to 2K and confirm the output location. I'm gonna keep it on MPEG-4 and set the denoise to GPU high. Once that's all set up and some test renders have been checked at smaller scales, I can finally hit the render on this bad boy and head to bed. <laughs> Just kidding. I do happen to have a finished render from the future for you right here. This is with some really cool flyer, lighting and camera tweaks by Joe Wilson that really makes this model shine. I really hope you have enjoyed this full-on tutorial series covering baking, lighting, texturing and rendering this cargo ship model. I do hope you like and subscribe to the Marmoset channel and let us know what you'd love to have a tutorial on next. But for now, have fun and cheerio friends.